welcome to our live feed here this morning in Bambridge Baptist Church. And wherever you're tuning in from, we, we welcome you in the Lord's name. I was just chatting to some of the gentlemen in this morning, and they were telling me that there's been people tuning in from Brazil and from Canada and from America and from India. So wherever in the world you're tuning in from, I know there's some even more local in Scotland and in England. Um, let me bid you a warm welcome. We're so pleased that you're joining with us this morning as we gather around the word of the Lord and we seek his face this morning. Just before we come to prayer, there are a number of folk in our assembly who are in need of prayer at this time. We want to continue to remember Winston Annett, who has, is still in hospital but has been making progress. Do pray for Muriel and the family circle at this time. Also Stanley, Stanley Morton, he's been in hospital and we want to pray for Jennifer and the family. Um, Fred McKelvey has had the coronavirus and is very weak at this time and in need of prayer. And this morning, you may have been expecting Pastor Taylor um, to be preaching. Unfortunately, he had a fall on Friday and has broken his arm in a couple of places. So he's in need of prayer at this time. And um, he's due to see the specialist in the incoming week to see what damage has been done. So all these folk are in need of prayer this morning as we come before the Lord. You and I, we're in need of prayer too. As we come and we meet around God's Word, we want God to speak to us. Uh, we want Him to meet with each of us in our homes, uh, that the Spirit of God would deal with each one of us um, as we come to His Word this morning. So we're going to ask for His blessing upon us. We're going to ask for His blessing upon each of these families that we've mentioned, and we'll come before Him now. So let's pray. Our Father, we come into your most holy presence and we give you thanks for the privilege that we have to do so. We thank you that we only come in through the name of our precious Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, we thank you even in the hymns that we've been enjoying before the service this morning, that there's that little chorus that says, Jesus, 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 sweetest name I know, fills my every longing, keeps me singing as I go. We praise you for our Savior, O God. We thank you, Father, for this great redemption plan, this plan of love, that we can now say there is now therefore no condemnation to them who are in Christ Jesus. Father, for each of us this morning that come before your throne, knowing salvation of our God, knowing that we can say the Lord is my salvation, Father, we praise you for that. We thank you for the day and hour that you met us on our road, on our hellbound road, and that, Father, that we were saved and our lives were changed and we experienced the joy and the satisfaction and the, the, our, the, all of our longing was fulfilled. And, Father, we praise you for such a Savior as this. We thank you, Father, that the Lord Jesus, he went to the cross at Calvary and there shed his precious blood for each one of us. We thank you, Father, that he hung there for the sin of the world. And we thank you, Father, that we can say today that the Lord Jesus Christ is alive, that he rose three days later, that, Father, we serve a risen Savior, and he's in the world today. We thank you, Father, as we come before you this morning, that as we read this book, that the Spirit of God ministers to each one of us, that the Spirit of God speaks to each one of us. And Father, I pray for each who listen in in their homes today, whether they be troubled from the week that's gone by or worried about the week ahead, whether they're on the mountaintop at this time, wherever they are, Father, I pray that you would speak to each one. Father, there are those in our assembly at this time who have been laid aside for quite some time. We want to remember Winston Annett and his family. We pray that you would continue to be with him. We pray that, you would, that they would continue to see improvements and that very soon he would be able to move from one hospital to the other. Father, we too pray for Stanley Morton. Uh, Father, we realize he's had a tough week. And Father, we thank you for the improvements near the end of the week. And we thank you that he was setting up. And Father, we pray for the family circle there. We pray for Jennifer. We pray for the rest of the family. And we pray that you would continue to be with them. Father, we re remember Fred at this time who has been low with the coronavirus. Father, we pray, O oh God, for each in our assembly who have been 
ill with this virus. And Father, we pray that you would clear it. We pray, Father, that you would build them each up to health and strength again. We pray for Fred. We pray that you would give him strength in these days. We pray, Father, that you will be with him, that he will know your presence with him, even in this time of trouble. Father, we want to remember Pastor Taylor as well. We remember John, and we pray for his arm. We pray, O oh God, that you, will, uh, that you will just be with him at this time. We pray that, Father, it would be not too, that there wouldn't be too much damage, that, Father, it would heal in good time, and that he wouldn't be in too much discomfort in the days and the weeks ahead. Father, we pray for our world at this time. Father, we realize that this coronavirus and many other things trouble this world. And Father, we pray for our nation. And Father, we pray indeed in these days that you would forgive us of our sin. Uh, Father, we realize that as a church that we have sinned, that we don't give you the place that you ought to have, that Father, we have replaced you with such a low view and Father, I pray that you would help us and grant us the grace that we would be able to put you back in a lofty position, that, Father, we will honor you and worship you the way we ought to. Father, we pray for healing for our land, not just of the coronavirus, but we pray, Father, for healing of sin. We pray for a moving of the Spirit of God again. And Father, we pray that you would help each of us, your church, to confess our sin, and we thank you, our God, that you have said that you are faithful and just to forgive us our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Father, bless each boy and girl that tunes in this morning. Bless them now as we speak to them in a few moments' time. And Father, we pray that you will shut us in, in your presence, in each of our homes, that we will know you are with us. We pray all these things in the precious name of our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Now, this morning, let me just take some time to um, give you the announcements for the incoming week. Um, as I've mentioned already, um, there's a number of folk who are laid aside, and do remember John, who has had this fall, um, so he'll be out for a few weeks. Um, so we just want to remember him at this time. Just when you thought you were getting rid of me for a wee while, you're stuck with me for a wee bit longer. But we trust that the Lord will bless us as we gather around his word uh, this morning. Uh, this evening again, we will meet for a time of praise on Facebook at 6 p.m. Do join in those times and let the hymns play um, before the service. And then at 6.30 p.m., we'll be here on Facebook Live, and God willing, I will be the speaker this evening. Our Youth Fellowship will meet on Zoom this evening at 8 p.m., and they're going to have an evening of games on Zoom. And for each of the young people, please keep an eye on the WhatsApp group for that. Tuesday evening, the Good News Club will meet, and they will again be meeting on Zoom at 6.45 p.m. That brings us round to Wednesday, when we have our Bible study and prayer meeting at 8 p.m., and we'll be continuing our studies in 1 Corinthians and um, we've been looking under the title, Called of God, and this Wednesday we'll be thinking about called to be wise, called to be wise. That brings us round to next Lord's Day, the 22nd of November. Um, Sunday School, uh, Andrew has left a little message here to read to you. Sunday School plans to recommence via Zoom on Sunday the 6th of December. Please contact Andrew Shaw with your email address so that a consent form can be sent out this week. Uh, the team will require a completed consent form prior to the 6th of December. And then Andrew encourages you to continue to encourage the children uh, to tune in to Colin, Colin Tinsley and his Hope for Youth channel on YouTube. We are God willing, hoping to be back in the building on the 29th of December, God willing, but we're monitoring that week by week. Um, so, boys and girls, it's good to see you this morning. Um, we, we're, we're, we're going to be thinking about, I've got a massive pencil here this morning. It's got a rubber at this end, and it's got a sharp lead at this end, and it's a big pencil. Hopefully, you're able to see it at home, and we hope that you'll be able to to listen in as we talk to each one of you this morning. Now, when I think about a pencil, 
and I think about school and how you need to bring it into school and how you need to do lots of things with it, there's one thing that I think about, first of all, and it's the hand that directs the pencil to write. If you leave the pencil on the desk, it's not going to do your maths or your English or your geography in school. It's not going to write all the answers. It needs to have a hand that takes it and lifts it and writes with it, and that's really important, isn't it? Because it reminds me for each of us, for those of us who know the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior, that we have a God who wants to direct us, who wants to lead us in the way we should go. A God who, if we place our lives in his hands, that he will show us the way we should live through his word, and he speaks to us. So a pencil, it reminds me, first of all, that there's the hand that takes it and writes with it, and that directs us. The second thing that I think when I think about a pencil, sometimes when you're writing with a pencil for a long, long time, the lead, it starts to get a little bit blunt. And as you're trying to write, the wood starts to hit the page. And that's not very good, is it? You want to write with a sharp pencil. You want to write with one that you're able to see your writing, that it is legible, that you're able to read your writing. I used to be a teacher, and I remember if someone came to me and they'd been writing with a blunt pencil, I could barely read their writing. So it was really important to have a sharp pencil. And you know, when I think about a sharp pencil, as we read God's Word, And as we study it, and as we learn lots of stories at Good News Club and Sunday School, and as we meet each Sunday morning and we talk to the boys and girls, how it's important, boys and girls, that as we read God's Word, that it sharpens us. It makes us alert. And the Spirit of God, He works in our lives if we're a Christian boy or girl, and He makes us more into the image of of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, what do I mean by image of the Lord Jesus Christ? All I mean to say is this, that as we read his word and as we seek to live more for the Lord Jesus, the Bible tells us that we will become more and more like him. We will want to speak the way the Lord Jesus spoke. We will want to live the way he lived. And we'll want to live to please God. So first of all, we've got the pencil, and we write with the pencil, and we direct the pencil, and God directs each of our lives. He directs our paths. That's what it says in Proverbs chapter 3. And then we remember that a pencil, it needs to be sharpened when it gets blunt. And sometimes we can get blunt, and we can make mistakes, and we can sin. But the thing is, God, he wants us to become more like the Lord Jesus and we can take the sharpener of God's Word, and we can sharpen it. Well, boys and girls, there's one thing that, that there's this end, on this end there's the lead, but on the other end we have a rubber. And you know, the rubber reminds me that even though we sin, and even though we make mistakes, that God, He promises that when we confess our sin, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sin. You see, Boys and girls, you might be listening this morning, and you might never have asked the Lord Jesus to save you from your sin. The wrong things that you think, the wrong things that you say, and the wrong things that you do that breaks God's law. But the wonderful thing, boys and girls, is this, that the Bible tells us if we turn away from our sin and we ask the Lord Jesus to save us, if we're sorry for the wrong things that we've done, that we've broken God's law, that we've, we've made God sad and he's angry with our sin. But if we come to him and ask him to forgive us for our sin, the Bible says, just like the rubber, God rubs out and gives us a clean slate. He rubs out our sin. The Bible says that God forgets our sin. It says he casts our sin into the sea of forgetfulness. How amazing is that? So God, he directs us just like we direct our pencil. His word sharpens us. And the rubber reminds me that God, when we confess our sin, casts our sea into the sea of forgetfulness. But, you know, the pencil is all about what's inside. You see, if you were to have nothing inside, well, we wouldn't be able to write because the lead runs right up the middle of the pencil. 
And it reminds me of a story in the Bible where God actually ended up saying, in 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 7, it says, man looks at the outward appearance, but God looks at the heart. You see, sometimes each of us, we can look the part when we come out on a Sunday morning in our lovely Sunday clothes, and we can sometimes come along to different meetings, and we look great, and we're going to the Good News Club, and we're going to Sunday school, and we can look like we're a Christian. But I wonder, in all things, when you're in school, do you show that you're a Christian in the way you behave? When you're at home, when you're talking with your mom and dad, do we show that we're Christian in the way that we behave and we talk to our parents? How important it is in all of our ways to show that we love God and in our heart to love him. How important is that? God, he sees all our ways and he knows what we are like in our hearts. But you know, not only does the pencil need directed, just like we do need directed by God, and not only does it need sharpened the way God's Word sharpens us, and not only do we have an eraser that can, that can remind us that our sin it can be cast into the sea of forgetfulness, and not only do we need to remember what's important is what's inside, but finally, the pencil, it leaves a trace. And you know, one of the most wonderful things as you get older, boys and girls, is this. Looking back and seeing what God has done in your life. Boys and girls, there's many older people listening today, and they've had so many difficult things have happened to them through their lives. But you know, they're able to look back, and they're able to think about how God has been faithful to them, and how God has walked with them through so many difficult and really hard times. And boys and girls, that's the same God that you worship too. And he is able to lead you and guide you through really tough times. What a God we have. So next time you're in school and you pick up your pencil, you can remember these little lessons from the pencil that God directs us, that his word sharpens us, you remember when you're rubbing out next time that God chooses to forget our sins because of what the Lord Jesus Christ has done. The pencil's all about what's inside, and God knows what's inside our heart. And the pencil leaves a trace. You can see what you've written when you're using your pencil. Boys and girls, I'm so glad that you've tuned in this morning, and I trust that you will have a wonderful week at school, and that hopefully we will see you again in the building very, very soon. Now, this morning, we're turning to God's Word, and we're turning to the book of Isaiah, the book of Isaiah and the chapter 6. The book of Isaiah and the chapter 6. On these next few Sunday mornings, what I would like to do is I would like to begin a little series which we're going to call Heavenly Vision heavenly vision. A couple of weeks ago, um, before Remembrance Sunday, the Sunday before, we spent some time in the Psalms, and we thought about this little phrase, be still and know that I am God. And what I would like to do is I would like to spend some time over the next couple of Sundays. It won't be an exhaustive study. It'll be a short one. But what I want to do is spend some time with people who had an encounter with God in the Bible. And what I want to do as we do that, I want to have a think about heavenly vision. That's what we're calling it. You see, what I want to do is for each of us that we would be considering the God of the Bible more and more in all aspects of our lives. We need a fresh glimpse of God at times as the church. Just during the week there, yesterday, I read a statement that was put out by the Free Presbyterian Church of Ulster, and they actually were writing about how they feel with this coronavirus that the Lord may be punishing us for the sin of the nation. And as I read that post, I thought about how, well, yes, we ought to be on our knees again before our God and pleading that he will forgive our land and forgive the church for sin. And it's so important to have this glimpse of God again. I remember when I was a lot younger at the Iron Hall, they preached a series called Glimpses of Glory. 
glimpses of glory. And I've never forgotten that title. Because as a church, all the time, through all years, how important it is to get a glimpse of God, to get a glimpse of glory, a heavenly vision. A heavenly vision. A vision of God that we would end up running for Him and worshiping Him and forgetting the things of this world and living for Him as we ought. Paul Washer, when preaching, once said this. He said, turn your eyes from worldly desires. You were made for higher things. The regenerate heart, the, the born-again Christian, will never find satisfaction in a fallen world. Where do you find your satisfaction this morning? Is it in Christ? Or are you still dabbling with the world, dear Christian, this morning? You know, when testifying to King Agrippa in Acts chapter 26, this is what Paul said. Here's a man who had a glimpse of glory on the road to Damascus. He testifies that he was not disobedient to the heavenly vision. Oh, dear brothers and sisters this morning, we need a fresh heavenly vision. Turn your eyes from worldly desire says Paul Washer, you were made for higher things. My hope and my prayer as we consider some people over the next few weeks who had a heavenly vision that we find in Scripture, that by the power of the Spirit of God, that our eyes, yours and mine, I need a fresh glimpse of God too, that, we will, that our eyes will be lifted heavenward, and that over the next number of Sundays, in the light of it, that we would be led to worship and wonder and to serve the God that deserves all our praise and all our honor. The, fundal, the fundamental fact of our faith is God. That God is holy, that God is majestic, that God is faithful, that He is mighty, that He is awesome, that He is transcendent. In fact, in Exodus 15 verse 11, it says, He is glorious in holiness. I don't think we'll ever understand the holiness of God in this life. But this morning, I want us to think of just getting a glimpse, just a glimpse of this God, a glimpse of glory, and it will captivate us forever. Heavenly vision. And this morning, as we turn to Isaiah in the chapter 6, what I want to think about this morning is a vision of the throne. A vision of the throne. And we're going to read the first eight verses here in the book of Isaiah. Isaiah in the chapter 6 and the verse 1. And this is the word of the Lord. And it says here, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. Above it stood the seraphims, each one had six wings, with twain he covered his face, and with twain he covered his feet, and with twain did he fly. And one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts, the whole earth is full of his glory. And the posts of the door moved at the voice of him that cried, and the house was filled with smoke. Then said I, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then flew one of the seraphims unto me, having a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with the tongs from off the altar. And he laid it upon my mouth and said, Lo, this hath touched thy lips, and thine iniquity is taken away, and thy sin purged. And I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? And who will go for us? Then said I, Here am I, send me. 
Now, a number of weeks ago, I gave this illustration as we began our studies in the book of Habakkuk, but I know a number may not have heard this illustration, and I think it's a very good one that helps us imagine and set the context for this little, bo- for this little chapter that we find in the book of Isaiah. There, there's a story told about two brothers who caused nothing but trouble for their parents. And they were always getting up to mischief, and the parents were so distressed with their children's behavior that they decided that they were going to send these two boys to their minister. And they wanted the minister to talk a bit of sense into the two boys that they would begin to behave. And the minister, he decided to deal with each of the boys one at a time, and he spoke to the eldest brother first, and he brought the boy into his office, and he leant over his desk, and he asked the question, where is God? And the little boy didn't really know what to respond. What that minister meant was, where is God in your behavior? And the little boy, he didn't know how to respond, so he remained silent. And the minister, he leant over his desk again, and he asked, where is God? And the little boy, he asked, or the minister, he asked the little boy this question three times, and after the third time, the boy didn't respond, but instead he stood, and he ran out of the minister's office, and he ran to find his little brother. And when he found his little brother, he said, oh boy, we're in trouble. God's gone missing, and they're blaming us. God's gone missing, and they're blaming us. And as we arrive in Isaiah in the chapter 6, for a few moments this morning, this statement, God has gone missing, would certainly describe the state of the people in the southern kingdom of Judah's hearts. And here as we come and we read the first line, we're told the timeline of when this event happened, when Isaiah had this vision of the throne. It says, in the year that King Uzziah died. Now, Isaiah, he's careful to tell us that this was the year that King Uzziah died. This was 740 years before the Lord Jesus would come as God incarnate. And we read of this account of King Uzziah in the book of 2 Chronicles in chapter 26. And we certainly realize that Uzziah when we give any time for consideration to him, we realize that God certainly had gone missing when King Uzziah died. And you know, it would be useful to consider this king this morning because there's quite a significant story. King Uzziah was brought to the throne of Judah when he was just 16 years old. 16 years old. He was a young man. He was uniquely gifted. He was a young man who was raised to a position of prominence by the Lord, and he was a young man who depended on the Lord to make his life useful as a king. How important that is. Dear young person listening in this morning, here was a young man who started out very well. He was a young man who realized in all things that he, d- that he did that if he was going to be useful, if he was going to be worthwhile, being the king of Judah, he was going to have to rely on the Lord. Dear young person listening in this morning, do you rely on the Lord in all things that you do? Dear young person this morning, do you serve the Lord in this church or do you serve the Lord in other places? Here was a king who was 16 years old, called by God, willing to be used by God, And here he is, a young man, and he says, I want to be useful as a king, so I'm going to depend on the Lord. He reigned for 52 years. And during that time, the Lord blessed him. He brought peace from the the enemies of Judah. He fortified Jerusalem. He, He brought security. He developed agriculture and commerce in Judah. What a wonderful king he was, greatly helped of God. And for much of his time as king, we read in verse 4 of 2 Chronicles 26, it says that he did what was right in the eyes of the Lord. Verse 6 says that he sought God in the days of Zechariah, and God made him successful. But then in verse 16, pride takes over. And pride becomes his downfall. It tells us King Uzziah, he was strong 
and his heart was lifted up to his destruction. Do you know what happened? He, he thinks now that because God has greatly helped him, that it's all about him, that it's all what he has done. And he thinks now that he can do absolutely anything, and he rushes to the temple to burn incense upon the altar, a job reserved for the priest. And Uzziah, he knew that. And Azariah, who was the chief priest, and 80 of his friends, 80 other priests, they come in and they confront the king, and they challenge him. And instead of being repentant and realizing his sin, the king, he becomes angry. He's angry at God. He's angry at these people around him. And God, he caused terminal leprosy to break out in his forehead right at that very moment. A leper, a leper was an outcast. So a king who had been greatly helped, a king who had relied on the Lord, a king who knew God's help, who God was his strength, a, a young man who had grown into to a successful king, and then he fails because pride takes over. And he dies an outcast, no longer a king, a king who had been greatly helped, a king who could have been useful and had been useful in the Lord's work. But when he took the Lord out of the equation, he became proud and he became very useless. Maybe this morning you're someone and you're involved in ministry. Could be amongst the children, could be providing music, you know what ministry you're involved in. And it may have been that over the years, the Lord has made you successful, that God has been on the move within your ministry, and He has blessed you, and the Lord has helped you greatly, just like King Uzziah. But you must never be taken over by pride of what you're doing, or you become useless. In ministry, it's not my strength. It's not your strength. What we do as the church of God, it's not of our own abilities that we're able to do it, but it is God who gives us strength. It is the God. It is that God makes us useful, and we ought to always be found on our knees, never, ever taking credit for ourselves. It is God and God alone who equips us, and it is God and God alone who makes us useful. You must never be taken over by pride. What about us as a church, a local church here in Bambridge Baptist? We must never become proud of who we are or the history that we have. Are there many activities that go on around the busyness of the week? It's not our work. It's God's. And He chooses to use you and me. What a privileged position to be in. But it's all that we would seek to bring glory to His name. Because it is God who makes us useful. So Uzziah, at the beginning of Isaiah 6, has just died. This king who's been successful but has died in tragedy. And it seems like the time of peace is over. A leader who had crumbled. And we turn to Isaiah 6 and we learn that we need not worry about crumbling politics around us here in our country and across our world today. We don't need to panic. Why? Because we find the Lord, and the Lord, He's still seated on the throne. I think it's really interesting that at the time that there had been a successful king who had fallen flat on his face, that that is the moment that God appears to Isaiah and gives him this wonderful vision of the throne of God. And what I want to do this morning in our time that's remaining, I just want to pick out a few phrases from this chapter that we've read, from these verses that we've read, and build upon them. And the first is this. He says, I, in the year that King Uzziah died, I, also, I saw also the Lord. I saw also the Lord. 
Isaiah, he saw the Lord. Chaos was all around. King Uzziah had died. And all the despair and all the anguish of the death of the king, all the people around can only see the king is dead, stability has crumbled, a crumbling leadership, the people have turned their backs on God, Judah has sinned, the surrounding nations have sinned, the whole earth has sinned. And what does Isaiah see? Yes, in the year the king Uzziah died, sin is rife, but Isaiah says, no, I look above it, and in the year the king Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord. We can lose focus of where we should be focused on. We look around us and we look horizontally and we see all the disaster. We see coronavirus. We see politics crumbling. We see everything going wrong. And our eyes very quickly are taken off the throne of God and our eyes are just on all the things that are happening around us. The devil causes our eyes to wander and observe the lawlessness around us and we easily lose sight of our God. But dear brothers and sisters this morning, we need to take our eyes off London, off Washington, off Moscow. And we need to remove our assumption that therein lies the future of this world. It doesn't lie there. How important that little word also is. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord. Because you see, Isaiah, he sees the same mess that everybody else is seeing. But he has this beautiful vision and he says, I saw also the Lord. I want you to notice the place that Isaiah saw the Lord. It says, I saw also the Lord sitting, sitting on a throne, sitting upon a throne. Here in the chaos that surrounds Judah, Isaiah sees Jehovah as king in his rightful place on the throne. John MacArthur has stated, there can be never much panic when you know God is still on the throne. And that is the most important thing for the child of God to remember today. Yes, we can say God is on his throne, but I wonder, do we really see it? I wonder, do we really see that God is still seated on his throne? How Isaiah, he's thrilled and he's in wonder because he declares in verse 5, For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. He's lost in wonder at the awesome sight which is before him. And Isaiah, Isaiah, he sees God in his glory and his majesty. And Isaiah, he sees God in all his fullness. And he hell can't help but speak of it. It pours out. He has to tell it. He writes in his prophecy, I saw the Lord. He says, my eyes have seen the king. Isaiah saw the Lord on his throne. The throne, it's a symbol of sovereignty. And it's a throne that is high and lifted up. That's what it says in verse 1. It's so lofty. It's so majestic. This throne is the throne lifted higher than any other. Isaiah, he sees greatness. He sees the majesty and sovereignty of his God, who is infinitely, infinitely greater than the highest conception or ideal that any man will ever have. A.W. Tozer says, God is always infinitely greater than anything that is said about him. We can't even speak about how great our God is. God is more sublime than all sublimity. He is loftier than all loftiness. He is more profound than all prof- profundity. He, is, he has more splendor than any of the splendor we can imagine. He is more majestic than all majesty. He is more merciful than all mercy. And he is more just, he's just more just than all justice. He is above all things. 
And we need to get our eyes off this appointment of our day and the disarray and the confusion around us. And we need to get our eyes fixed in the throne again and get our eyes fixed in the king just the way Isaiah does when there's disaster around, when everything's going wrong, when the sin of the nation is around him. He says, I saw also the Lord. When we see him lifted up and our eyes are set on him in the throne, everything changes. Surely we need to take our eyes off the things around us and keep our eyes on him. Then our hearts will rejoice within us and the earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Heavenly vision. Maybe you're sitting at home this morning and you're dreading the week ahead. A hospital appointment is looming. constant worry of your family going in and out and this coronavirus going round, worrying about the children, worrying about parents. Depression and sadness may have gripped you. And yet, Isaiah, when he saw disaster, said, I saw also the Lord. And where did he see the Lord? On his throne. You see, how important it is to remember that God is in the throne and you must put him in the throne of your life. Get your eyes on him. We see the place where God was. He was on his throne. But secondly, we see something about God's presence. Look at verse 1 again. It says, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne high and lifted up and the train of his robe filled, filled the temple. If you want to experience the presence of God, there's no room for anything else. Isaiah in his vision saw the robe of God Jehovah and it filled the temple. The temple was filled to capacity with the glory of God. And how Paul reminds us in 1 Corinthians, know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you, this robe had filled the temple completely, and we ought to allow God to fill us completely. That's when we will experience His presence. He is disgusted with the films that we watch, the literature that we allow to pass through our hands and before our eyes. His spirit is driven within him when he discovers some of the things that the church have allowed to come in. Is it no wonder, and I agree with them wholeheartedly, that the Free Presbyterian Church put out that statement this week to say that God's people need to repent. Is there any wonder? How do we experience his presence? Well, we must see him first in his place on the throne. And then we'll discover his person. Because we see in verse 3, how Isaiah calls out and he says, how one cried unto another when he speaks of the seraphim, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is filled with his glory. In passing, how interesting it is to note that the seraphim use four of their wings for worship and two of their wings for service. We often get that the wrong way around, don't we? But we often do the whole service thing and the worship takes the back seat. Worship an afterthought and doing, doing, doing. Make sure we get our priorities right. First phrase we've looked at, I saw also the Lord. Second phrase I want to look at is in verse 5. And in verse 5, we read that Isaiah says this. He says, Woe is me, for I am undone. Do you see how this vision, it shifts the focus of the sin of others to the focus on the sin of the prophet himself. Woe means destruction. That's what that word means. And he sees himself before God and he goes, God, I am nothing before you. And he actually, in the chapters before, he's been, he's been saying destruction to all these other people, but this vision comes to him and he all of a sudden says, destruction is me, woe is me, for I am undone. 
Listen, he, he had said, woe to the wicked, chapter 4, verse 11. Chapter 5, verse 8, he says, woe to those who join house to house. Verse, chapter 5, verse 11, he says, woe to those who rise early in the morning that they may follow intoxicating drink. Chapter 5, verse 18, he says, woe to those who draw iniquity with cords of vanity. Chapter 5, verse 20, he says, woe to those who call evil good and good evil. Chapter 5, 21, he says, woe to those who are wise in their own eyes. Chapter 5, verse 22, woe to men, mighty in drinking wine, valiant for mixing intoxicating drink. And he sees the sins of Judah, and he comes to this chapter, and he's been condemning them, condemning them, condemning them. And then he makes this reference to King Uzziah, who is, reminds us of this right sin standing before God but then the next thing is he sees himself before God you know in the Bible a great mark of a godly man or woman and the great mark of a man or woman that has encountered Christ is that they are found in humility there's a humility that grips their lives and they see themselves as they really are Isaiah initially sees a fallen kingdom, but does God's word not remind us that kingdoms rise and fall, but the word of our God shall stand forever? Isaiah 40 in the verse 8. Isaiah turns his eyes to the Lord in the need that confronted him, and all of a sudden he realizes his own sinfulness before a holy God. This is a prophet, this is God's messenger. And all of a sudden, the rest of the nation peels into insignificance as he realizes that he needs to deal with his own sin first. And he says, woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips. Maybe the greatest reminder we need this morning is that we need to pray this prayer. Do I need to pray it? I do. I need to say, woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips. Because when I come before this God, Yahweh Adonai, I realize that I'm unworthy to even stand here this morning. And dear brother and sister this morning, do we need to get back to that point where we're fully reliant on God, you may say to me, well, Peter, you know, you, you bang on about this a wee bit. You know, if I knew that we were a full church of Christ, who knew our need as an assembly before God, our prayer meetings would be packed. But they're not. Maybe it's time for us to say, in all this disaster, first of all, I saw also the Lord. And then to say, woe is me, for I am undone. I'm a man of unclean lips. The third phrase, penultimate phrase we're going to look at, is in verse 7. And he says this. He says, and he led it. It's, it talks about the seraphim, sorry, in verse 6 to get the context. It says, Then flew one of the seraphims unto me, having a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with the tongues from off the altar. And he laid it upon my mouth and said, Lo, this hath touched thy lips, and thine iniquity is taken away, and thy sin is purged. This hath touched thy lips. He touched my mouth. You see, we see one of the seraphim and he takes a piece of live coal from the altar and he touches the lips of the prophet, or the prophet and he says, iniquity has been taken away, your sin has been atoned for. The piece of coal was taken from the altar, the place of sacrifice, the place of atonement. This is where the high priest would have sacrificed a lamb for the sins of the people. And in this passage and for Isaiah, we find an altar and that's, that's so important there. That was important in the Old Testament times, this altar which pointed towards the Lord Jesus Christ. But today we no longer need an altar. We have a cross. 
And it's at the cross that our sins were atoned for, for as much as ye know that ye were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation, received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, as a lamb without blemish and without spot, who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, that but was manifest in these last times for you, who by him do believe in God, that raised him up from the dead and gave him glory, that your faith and hope might be in God. We have a cross. We only need an altar if there's something remaining to sacrifice. But praise God, there's nothing remaining. The Lord Jesus Christ declared it himself on the cross. He cried, it is finished. And we can approach this God who sits in the throne this morning through the finished work of Calvary and how the world needs to see people with touched lips and transformed lives and lives are transformed at the cross of Jesus Christ. And we approach the throne boldly this morning. Why? Because we have a great high priest, the Lord Jesus Christ, that is passed into the heavens. Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession for we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace. We can approach the throne, why? That we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. What a Savior! A cross work that allows us to approach this high and lofty throne this morning. I saw the Lord I saw also the Lord sitting on a throne. Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips. Thirdly, he touched my mouth. Finally, we read in verse 8, the Lord sends out the call, and the Lord says this, and also I heard of the voice saying, Whom shall I send? And who will go for us? Then said I, Here am I. Send me. No one will ever truly say, Here am I, send me. Until they can say, I saw also the Lord. No one will be useful in the Lord's work until they humble themselves before the King of Kings on the throne and say, Woe is me. But in the doom and gloom of our lives, I wonder, have we lost the sight of the one who is on the throne? John Gill says for Isaiah, who before thought himself undone and unworthy to be employed in the service of God, now having a discovery and application of pardoning grace, freely offers himself to God. He says, here am I, send me. He's in the ready place now. He's humbled himself. And this shows the true nature and effect of an application of pardon. It gives a man freedom. It gives us boldness to go into the presence of God. And it gives us boldness to serve this God and to be a channel that he can use. And it's the stimulus. And it makes us ready and cheerful to obey the will of God. Heavenly vision. I wonder with a fresh vision of the King of Kings and with a knowledge of sins forgiven, touched lips, shed blood, are we willing to say, here am I, send me. Let's come before the Lord just now and pray. Our Father, this morning we realize that we do come before a high and lofty throne. And Father, we come humbly and reverently before that throne just now. And we realize, O oh our God, that just as Isaiah cried, that he was a man of unclean lips, that each of us, O oh God, we are completely unworthy to stand before your throne. 
And, O oh God, this morning I pray that for each one that you would touch our lips, that, Father, that you would cleanse us from sin afresh. Father, when we think of that piece of coal that came from the altar, we praise you that we can say no blood upon the altar now. We praise you that there is no need for the sacrifice of any more lamb. But, Father, we praise you for the sacrifice of the Son of thy love, the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you, our God, because of that, that we can come into your most holy presence this morning. But Father, Father, we thank you that we're able to go further. Oh, God, we thank you that we are able to serve you. Father, thank you that you would choose to use us in the work of of our mighty God. Father, spare us from being like King Uzziah, one who was greatly helped, but pride took over. Father, help us to be careful to give you all the glory and honor and praise that should always be unto your name. Father, we pray that you will continue to speak now that the voice of man will go silent, we pray that the Spirit of God would minister on. Oh, Father, give us a loftier view. Give us heavenly vision, a glimpse of glory again. We pray this in the precious name of our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Well, let me remind you that this evening we will be back on Facebook Live at half past six here in the church, um, and we trust that you will join us this evening. We'll be back in the book of Isaiah this evening. We'll be considering Isaiah in chapter one. Uh, please do share around with those who you know that may not know the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior. Uh, please let them know about this meeting, and please do share it widely um, so that as many people can hear the wonderful, life-changing message of the gospel. Thank you so much for tuning in with us this morning. We trust that the Lord will bless you this and this his day, and we pray that you will certainly know his help in the incoming week. God bless.